good afternoon. Today I am going to be doing a video about Thornwald cyst or full-blown Thornwald disease. Um, some may ask, what is a Thornwald cyst? Well, the easiest, most micro-condensed version I can give you is it is a congenital birth defect. Um, it typically occurs about the 10th week in embryonic development. Um, the first thing that develops in an embryo is the spinal cord. And once that spinal cord forms, the top of the cervical spine, right here, um, there's a spot called the notochord. And that notochord, developmentally speaking, should basically create a little fold and close that orifices off to begin the development of the endoderm, our brain. However, in patients with a Thornwald cyst, that notochord orifices doesn't ever fully seal. So when the endoderm starts to develop, there is essentially a little pouch left there for infection and mucosa to get trapped in. When a Thornwald cyst does develop in that orifices and causes full-blown Thornwald disease, a patient will typically present to the emergency department with ear, nose, and throat issues, um, such as chronic obstruction of the nose, maybe ostis media, where they're not fully hearing from both ears. Um, maybe they have a high-pitched ringing in their ears or um, a severely sore throat with no infection present. So patients will present to the ED with ear, nose, and throat complaints or otolaryngology complaints. Um, typically, the ED department will do an MRI or a CT of the head and neck to verify that there is no cranial, cranial abnormalities or vasculature problems within the cervical spine. Um, nine times out of ten, if a patient does have this congenital birth defect and they present to the ED with such problems, a Thornwald cyst will incidentally be noted, but the patient will not be informed. The patient will be given nine times out of 10 antibiotics, um, told that they have chronic cyanitis or um, allergic rhinorrhea, which is a constant drip of the nose, and discharged and sent home with antibiotics. Well, the problem with the Thornwald cyst is antibiotics will not cure the infection present because it is in the midline of the brain, basically, where the paranasal sinuses meet the development of the brain. So it can cause throat obstruction, um, a feeling of obstruction in the nasal cavity. It could cause ear fullness or the feeling of fluid within the ear cavity. Um, so let me stop. I was in 2010, I started developing chronic problems um, related to my vision, hearing, and cervical neck, cervical spine, excuse me. Um, I went to the ED December of 2010, three times, sent home every time, told that it was all in my head, that there was no problem. I had chronic um, cyanitis and I needed to see an ear and nose and throat specialist. So about two weeks went on and I started to develop a three and sixth damaged cranial nerve where my right eye essentially began to cross in and I couldn't get it to retract back normally. So I called 911, the ambulance came and took me back to the ED. I was subsequently diagnosed with idiopathic intracranial hypertension which is either an abnormal production of cerebrospinal fluid or an abnormal absorption of the cerebrospinal fluid within the body. In my case, they don't know. So I was admitted to Clovis Community Regional Medical Center and I underwent a slew of tests. I had a lumbar puncture to test the opening pressure of my brain. Um, which the opening pressure was roughly 68 and normal cerebrospinal fluid pressure in a patient is roughly between 10 to 15. So the doctor who performed the LP drained the excessive pressure off my brain and admitted me to the hospital. 
I was put on acetazolamide to reduce the pressure in my brain and referred to a neurologist. I started seeing a neurologist um, in Clovis, California, who verified diagnosis of IH, um, kept increasing my Diamox, and I was scheduled for basically weekly or biweekly lumbar punctures at my local hospital to drain the fluid off my brain because the acetazolamide wasn't doing the job. Um, I did that for about seven months and my vision was still rapidly decreasing. I had papilledema. I was then referred to UCSF in San Francisco. I saw a neuro-ophthalmologist who validated that I had papilledema but denied that I had idiopathic intracranial hypertension due to my size. Um, he said that people of my stature, my size, do not get IH, um, that IH is essentially a fat person's disease, and that there is no further treatment he can offer me. So I came back to the valley, got on a support group, and I found um, a girl named Amber Armstrong who referred me to her neurosurgeon at California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco. I fought with my insurance company for a long time to get an authorization because he was out of network. Um, it was finally approved. I had my first, first consultation in August of 2011, just shortly, probably like seven, eight months after I was diagnosed with IH. Dr. Andrews confirmed diagnosis based off medical history, um, the amount of lumbar punctures I had had with the extensive high opening pressure numbers that I had um, and the extensive papilledema. So he said I needed a ventricular peritoneal shunt in my lateral ventricle to basically reroute the cerebrospinal fluid to my abdomen, my peritoneal cavity. August 11th, 2011, I had my first VP shunt placement. I did pretty good. Um, about 10 weeks later, I started developing flu-like symptoms and I called my neurosurgeon. He said, I'm in Hawaii, go to your nearest emergency department, which I obviously wasn't messing with Clovis community. So I had my husband take me to San Francisco where his colleague, Dr. Cobbs, asked for authorization to perform another lumbar puncture, which of course I said yes. He did the lumbar puncture and my opening pressure was 36. So he informed me that there must be a problem with my shunt and asked for authorization to do a shunt function study. I was admitted to the hospital. They did a shunt function study and realized that I had um, a clog in this lateral ventricle here. So mind you not, my neurosurgeon is in Hawaii. I desperately need surgery. Um, Dr. Cobbs calls Andrews and Andrews says, yes, go ahead and do the revision. So I'm signed up that day for my first shunt revision. He revised my shunt and he noted that I had elevated protein in my cerebrospinal fluid as well as elevated glucose. So he followed up with Dr. Andrews. Dr. Andrews advised him to put an antibiotic tip in my lateral ventricle, which Dr. Cobbs did. He sealed me and sent me home. I was good for about 16 weeks. Then I started developing extremely high pressure again and the visual disturbances, the loss of peripheral vision, and just all the chronic problems that sent me to the hospital in the first place. So I go doc back to Dr. Andrews. I have another shunt function study. He verifies that my tubing has, or excuse me, my ventricle has collapsed around the catheter of the shunt. So he tries aspirating the brain matter out of the shunt catheter. No luck. So I'm sent home because it is December of two. 2011 and my son is just about to turn four four yeah four 
and I really didn't want to miss his fourth birthday, so I told Dr. Andrews I would schedule surgery for after the new year. So the new year came, and I scheduled my fourth VP shunt revision open craniotomy. The surgery was successful, however, this ventricle was so damaged that he had to go into this side and put another port. I know I have so much hair so it's hard to see. But so now it's 2011 and I've had four craniotomies. I'm now bilaterally shunted. Life goes on, right? You just deal with the pain, you get over it. I'm a mom, I have to just go on with life, right? And I'm a military wife at that, so I don't have a choice. My husband's gone a lot. Um, I continue to have problems, and now it's January of 2020, and I'm still chronically ill. I have reached out to an otolaryngologist in Denver, Colorado to hopefully get a second opinion on the congenital birth defect because the otolaryngologist slash ENT that I saw at CPMC refused to do surgery because he said that it would damage my vocal cord. However, he was mistaken. The cysts that he noted on my vocal box were not or excuse me, was not the Thornwald cyst, it was a mucus retention cyst. So he refused to do surgery. So I'm basically back at square one, 10 years later, searching for answers. And I am so hopeful that Dr. Hepworth will look at my scans and say, I clearly know you had idiopathic intracranial hypertension. However, I think I hope he can validate my theory. My theory is, let me back up, sorry. Um, my shunt's broken right now, so I'm in here really high pressure, so my brain's just like all over the place. Um, but my theory is, is that when I was six months old, I was admitted to the hospital for lethargy and severe dehydration. Uh, my mom said that I was having problems eating and drinking. I would choke. So I just really wasn't eating or drinking properly. So one night she woke up and I was completely black and blue um, and non-responsive. So she called 911 and the ambulance took me to um, Madera Community Hospital, which is the worst hospital locally known to man. But anyways, she didn't know. So six months old at Madera Community Hospital, I had a severely high fever um, that was causing febrile seizures. And so I was admitted, I spent um, quite a bit of time at Madera Community Hospital with a diagnosis of idiopathic high fever syndrome and sent home. Well, problems just kept developing and about the age 11, I started fainting, having, having repeated fainting spells. Um, whether it was while I was doing PE or just walking down the hall to go to bed, I started developing vision problems. I had a chronic headache. I was still having these throat problems um, where I would choke on food spontaneously or even drinking something. And so my mom started seeking help. She took me to every specialist she could possibly think of. Um, at age 12, an ear, nose, and throat specialist finally suggested that I have my tonsils and adenoids removed. So I went on to have my tonsils and adenoids re removed and I still had problems. So my primary care physician told my mom that I should be followed by a neurologist. So my mom took me to more neurologists than I'd even like to mention. Um, they basically all told her that I was that she was crazy and there was nothing wrong with me. Maybe I just had a little bit of depression, um, but there was nothing wrong with me. So basically stopped trying to find answers. So she did. 
which I guess I would have